The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now, many people would say that, well, Pastor Mark, because I'm a believer, because I've put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be no judgment for me, but I'm sorry, you are wrong. There are two judgments that we will face. There are two judgments that every person breathing now or has breathed in the past, everybody who has lived and and sucked air and taken a breath whose heart is beat, you will stand before God at either the judgment seat of Christ or at the great white throne judgment. But all of us will be judged by an almighty God. And I wanna talk about this today after this, the judgment. After this, the judgment. Now, I, I want to, you to see the difference between the two. So first of all, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians and chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians and chapter number 3. This is the judgment for the believers. This is the judgment for the believers. We will read a few past, uh, verses of Scripture about the, the judgment seat of Christ, and then we will read a few verses about the great white throne judgment. Most of the time when we think about God and the judging of, of mankind, we, in our minds, immediately go to the great white throne judgment, but, uh, but sometimes we forget about this judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ. So stand, if you would, uh, out of respect for the reading of God's Word, you found 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, then we're going to skip over to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation's the last book in the Bible. You can turn over there and find Revelation in chapter number 20. Put your finger there. You can hold it. And we'll first of all begin in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And we'll begin reading in verse number 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Notice that, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Now watch what Paul says, yet so as By fire. In other words, Paul says he is saved literally by the skin of his teeth. Only his soul is saved, but his works have not been manifest. Now, Now look there in Revelation chapter 20 in verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were uh, delivered up the dead which were in them, and, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I saw, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven uh, heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, are true and faithful. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, I pray that you would open our eyes. Lord, I pray that we would see that we will give an accounting one day. And may we not be empty-handed. Lord, may we not be standing in ashes as we give that account. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You can be seated. 
The second reading is of the great white throne judgment and is where God will judge all mankind and it will be from that point that man will be brought up out of hell and they will be brought before the Lord Jesus Christ and they will give an account of whether they have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, whether their name has ever been written into the book of life or not. The first reading was of the judgment seat of Christ. This is gonna take place during the seven years of tribulation. Uh, During the seven years of tribulation, there's gonna be a couple events that are gonna be going on One is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I believe that's some of the reason that some Baptists have gotten saved, Brother Luke, is just so they can go to another dinner. As you know, Baptists like potluck, and if we say there's going to be a dinner, we'll add about an extra hundred people, and uh, I believe some are just wanting to get in on the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I mean, it's going to be a dinner you're not going to want to miss, because there's not going to be a single casserole one in that entire heavenly uh, throne and, uh, and, and table there. No casseroles. All casseroles will have their place in the lake of fire, which burneth forever and ever. But if you'll notice here, one thing that I just want to mention by way of uh, of reading this passage of Scripture, it is not until Revelation chapter 20 that the tears are wiped away. So in other words, there's going to be some tears from Christians and from the lost in heaven. Now there's a lot of great songs. One of my favorite songs, uh, Dottie Rambo wrote, Tears will never stain the streets of that city. There's no wreaths of death on my mansion door. If you remember that song, there is a day that God's going to wipe, wipe away all the tears. But it's not going to be after, till after the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. You see, from Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 20, the church is raptured out. The, the, the church is, is taken away in Revelation chapter number 4. But from 4 to 20, there's going to be a lot of tears shed. And you see, after chapter 4, we're with the Lord. Now, now the, the, so those tears are not shed on earth. Those tears are, are, are shed in heaven because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So the minute that, that, that the trumpet sounds, the trump of, of God sounds, and, and, and the voice of the archangel shouts, the saved on, that are alive and the saved that are in the ground, we're caught up together to meet the Lord. In the, I mean, we're, we're out of here. We're given a new body. A body without pain, a body without cancer, a body without problems, a body without aches. I mean, if you're getting a little bit older, some of y'all should be amen and right now, knee replacements and, I mean, Geritol and hot water bottles. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. And, uh, I mean, we, we used to, uh, I mean, we used to get up and, and, our, our, and go and now our, our, our go has got up and gone. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And uh, we'll have a body where we don't have to hold stuff out here, but our eyes will be clear. And we'll have a heart that is only focused on the Lord. But there's one thing that that new body can do that our old body can do, and that's going to be cry. You see, he doesn't wipe the tears away till the end. You say, "Now, now why is that significant? Because I want you to understand the significance of these two judgments. These two judgments are probably the two key events for Christians to understand and for unbelievers to understand that these are two key events where they will face God. The Bible says that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At that day, everybody will confess him as Lord. Brother Michael, I think sometimes we misunderstand that there's three heavens. There's the, there's the heaven where the birds fly. There's, there's, there's the atmosphere, and, and that, that's the first heaven. Then there's the second heaven, and that's the Milky Way, and, and that's the galaxies, and that's the second heaven. But there's the third heaven, and that's the habitation of God. That's where God dwells. And for us to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, we're going to the third heaven. We don't go to the first heaven and float on a cloud with a harp. Some of y'all would make some ugly naked angels. (laughs) In fact, all of us would, amen. No clouds. We're not floating on the clouds. We don't go float around in the galaxy. We don't become a star. We go to be in the presence of Almighty God. We go right to his presence and we're standing before God whose eyes are as a flame of fire, whose whose voice is as a mighty thunder. You said the eyes is a flame of fire. Yeah, that means that they can burn right through you and know the truth and you can give every excuse and you can give every reason and you can give everything you want to, but God knows. And no excuses will stand on judgment day. So, three things. Number one, There's going to be a rewarding of the saints. There's going to be a rewarding of the saints. After the rapture, 
There are seven years of tribulation. We talked about the tribulation period. During that seven years of tribulation on earth where God is pouring out his wrath and his judgment, there's gonna be two things that happen. There's gonna be the marriage supper of the Lamb and there's gonna be the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat. Now, you've gotta meet the master before you go eat the meal. You have to meet the master before you eat the meal. Did you, hear, you gotta meet the master before you go. Everybody just thinks, well, I'm just gonna slip in on the table. No, you're gonna meet the master first and you're gonna give an account of every action, every attitude, every, everything that you've done, you will give an account for it. Now, you're not being judged for your sin because your sin was judged on the cross. He nailed our sins to the cross, past, present, and future. Our sin was paid for there, but rather we will be judged about what we could have done and should have done for Christ. It's all gonna be exposed on that day. It's gonna be very clear. You see, our deeds, whether they're gold, silver, precious stones, as we read, or wood, hay, and stubble, are gonna be put on the conveyor belt of heaven that's gonna take it through a fiery furnace. Wood, hay, and, I mean, I mean uh, gold, silver, and precious stones will become more precious, refined by the refiner's fire. Wood, hay, and stubble will be consumed we'll be left with nothing. And if that is your case, if you're standing in ashes, Paul said you will be saved so as by fire. Ambitions, attitudes, actions. And the Bible says in Paul's passage in 1 Corinthians chapter three that Luke, we will suffer loss. If our deeds are consumed, we will suffer loss. Nate, what that means is this. God will project somehow in heaven all that you could have done and should have done but didn't do. And you will suffer loss. Can I say at that day there will be tears spilled in heaven as the tears run down your face, as the te tears spill down your cheek knowing how you've disappointed the Lord. I think one of the greatest benefits of our Deeds, our work for Christ, surviving. I, th I think one of the greatest things is the crowns that we'll receive for that. And those crowns we'll get to cast back at the feet of Jesus. As I thought about this and as I prayed about this, I thought how many people are gonna be standing in ashes, standing at the judgment seat at my Savior's side and looking into his wonderful face. I wonder did I do my best and run to win my race. Chances to serve him are over as wood, hay, and stubble mount. The fire will now reveal my final account. The fire consumes my deeds as my heart is heavy and broke. My life has been so useless as it goes up in simple smoke. I stand before him empty-handed as my life before me flashes. All the guilt and shame I feel standing there in the ashes. I remember having some of my relatives who meant well come to me and go, now Mark, you're leaving a good career in the army and you've made a good career of yourself and you've gotten promoted below the zone and you've done good things. And Chris, you know how hard it is to get promoted BZ, especially as an officer. And man, you've gotten promoted, you've got this good career, you've just got a few more years, you can finish an active duty retirement. Why would you stop and start preaching? What, what are you doing about your retirement? How, I mean, are there not jobs that paid more? I mean, you, you were in a job that paid more. Why are you doing that? And man, I, I got grilled on, are you not gonna take care of your family? Look what this person has got. Look what this person has got. And finally, I just looked at him and I said, Here, here's what I know. One of these days when I stand before God, I wanna stand before God right. You say, but you may not leave behind a big house. So what? My house is pretty nice too. God's taking care of me. But you may not have a lot of money in the bank. I don't want to leave anything for my kids. They'll fight over it. I'm going to spend it all. I'm telling you. I mean, every animal in Alaska is going to be shot before I leave anything for my kids to fight over. You say, now, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? I'm saying this, the retirement program in heaven, lay up for yourselves treasures where thieves and moth and rust does not corrupt and, and nobody can touch it. Don't lay up treasure down here, but think about up there. In Sunday school, I shared with them the, how crazy it is to me that we will look at Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, nobody else to defend us and give an accounting for our lives and how little that concerns us. 
I, I high school rodeoed and I drew a bull that was a pretty bad bull known to step on some people and stuff. And so I tried to turn out. I tried to turn out and not ride, but my dad told me he had already paid his 25 bucks and we didn't have a lot of money and 25 bucks was a lot of money. And so I said, okay, I'll ride. I got on the bull and I rode that night and I rode it for about five seconds and I got bucked off and he went left and I went right and I landed on the ground, 16 year old boy. And I was laying there looking up and I saw that hoof come down. Now back then we didn't have protective gear. You wore a Wrangler shirt, you wore Wrangler blue jeans and a cowboy hat. All these sissies that ride with all these vests and helmets and I don't even know what to say about it. We used to ride like men back in the day. It's back when men were men and women were too. And it was tough. Way you could tell somebody was married back where I grew up is there's tobacco running down both sides of the truck instead of one, amen? And so I got stepped on on my chest and y'all know that was funny. Don't act like, don't act like you didn't think that was funny. I got stepped on on my chest and I broke some ribs. And so I rolled over and started trying to crawl away and he turned around and landed up with his back legs on my back and broke some ribs. And I ended up going to the hospital for a week. I told my dad, I was like, man, this costs more than $25, I bet. <laughs> now, now listen, here's my point. Brother Eddie, I'd rather be stomped on by a bull than disappoint my daddy. I'd rather spend a week in the hospital than my daddy look at me and say he's embarrassed of me. Think about that next time you decide not to live for God. You're disappointing the one who gave his son for you. That motivates me to live for God. That motivates me to want to do right. <clears throat> one of my favorite stories is about a boy who lived during the Depression and didn't have anything. His daddy had been killed in the war in World War I and his mom had taken him down to the little mercantile store and they had a big 55-gallon whiskey barrel full of candy. The little boy was standing there looking in the barrel with all the candy, different types of candy and wouldn't touch it. Just his nose was over the edge. He wanted it bad, but he didn't get any. His mom shopped the whole time and he just stared, sit there and glared, just just glared at that candy, just dreaming what it would taste like. The store owner looked down and he saw the little boy. He knew the circumstance. The mom was barely making ends meet. and Daddy had been killed in the war. And He said, son, get you a handful of candy. And the boy just sat there and didn't move. He said, son, go ahead and get you a handful of candy. The little boy just sat there and didn't move. Finally, the third time he said, hey, son, don't you hear me? Are you, are you deaf? Get some candy. The boy didn't say anything. Finally, that man got down off there. He said, you're so crazy. You won't even listen to me. He scooped two big old handfuls of candy up and shoved them in his pocket and shoved them in his hand. He said, now get out of here. The little boy went out and sat on the porch. The mama finished her shopping and came out and said, now, son, I know you heard him the first time. Why, 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 why didn't you just, why, did, why didn't you acknowledge him? He looked at his mom and he said, mama, because his hand was a lot bigger than mine. Can I tell you this? If you'll live for God down here, his hand is way bigger than yours. <clears throat> You're trying to figure out things that God's already taken care of. There's gonna be a rewarding of the saints. Will you be standing in ashes? I know some people who the only reason they do stuff is for credit. In fact, when there's no glory offered, there's no work done. I love it at the judgment seat of Christ. All those people that never got to get up here are gonna be rewarded up there. And I'm afraid a lot of the people that get to get up here, this was their reward. You're gonna be judged on why you did it. The rewarding of the saints, number two, very quickly, the rejection of sinners. All the unsaved will be brought out of hell. They'll be united with their bodies. The Bible says, and the sea and the earth gave up the dead that were with him. That, that gives a, a lot new meaning, a lot more meaning to me as Osama uh, uh, bin Laden was buried in the sea. The sea's gonna give up his body and it's gonna be uh, reunited with uh, uh, his soul. 
John chapter 5 and verse number 27 says, All authority for judgment has been given by the Father unto the Son. And Philippians says that, that all knees are going to bow before him, and now the books are going to be opened and sinners are going to be judged. The first book that's going to be opened is the book of life. And, and, and if your name is not written in the book of life, I'm glad that one day there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Y'all remember that old song? And the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There was one day that God put my name in the book of life, written in the blood of his precious son. You can't erase blood. Once it's written in blood, it can't be erased. It's there forever. You say, well, I, I, I've been saved, but I think I lost it. If you ever really got saved, you've never lost it. Can't lose something that you didn't have to find. It found you. He's seeking and saving that which is lost. He said, they that are holy, not a physician, but they that are sick, he came looking for you and he found you and he put your name in the book of life. And anybody whose name is not found in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. There's another book that we'll be judged by and it's the book of works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved of faith, that not of yourselves, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. What that means, Mike, from what I understand, he brings up the works thing just to show people that no one can live perfect enough to obtain grace. Yeah, I believe he's gonna say, hey, here's your works and you did a lot of good, but there's no way you can measure up to the law. The book of works. I think another reason the book of works are brought up, and, and, and I'm gonna go very quickly through this, but in hell, Luke, in hell, I believe everybody burns at the same degree of temperature. But in the lake of fire, and if we were to go over to the book of Isaiah and a couple Old Testament passages today, I believe in the lake of fire, there's different degrees. Some people will burn hotter than others. And if we had time, I could prove that to you today. I believe the book of works are brought up because here, here's what's gonna happen. You say, well, it's all those child molesters and it's all those vile people who committed genocide and all of the, yeah, hell's gonna be hot for them, but... Hell's also gonna be hot for you because you hear it every Sunday. Every time you walk by a Bible, every time you turn the radio off when the preacher's preaching, every time you come in here and you start getting under conviction and you pull your cell phone out and you turn me off, God's gonna turn the lake of fire up just a little bit hotter. You're gonna be judged by your works. We're gonna be judged by the word of God. The word of God is the final authority. The word of God stands. It's, it, it's inspired. It's infallible. It's an Aaron. It's perfect. I mean, we got a perfect Bible here, and we're going to be judged by the word of God. We're going to be judged by the book of eternity because once eternity starts, nothing can be changed. There's going to be a rejection of sinners. All liars will have their place in the lake of fire. I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. When I was in the army and we would deploy, we would have what they called barrack lawyers. That's people who, in the barracks, would tell you everything that's going on in the unit, supposedly. They really knew nothing, but they were good rumor starters. Some of y'all that are in the army know what you're talking about. And at Highview Baptist Church, we got a few barrack lawyers too, so I'll just let you know. And they are, no, I'm not gonna name them today, but... uh. I saw some people go, eh! Um, so now, here, here's the thing. All liars. Now, these barrack lawyers, here's what they would do. They would go in and they would say things like, yeah, I heard our deployment's getting cut short. Hey, I heard we're gonna get three weeks for R&R &R instead of two weeks. I mean, Chris, the rumors that circled with all that, I mean, we would hear all kinds of stuff about, oh, this is gonna happen. Oh, I heard the commander's gonna give us the day off, no missions on Sunday. We heard all of these different things. None of them were true. Now get this. All liars shall find their place in the lake of fire. You imagine the rumors and the lies that are going around through the pits of hell. Now here's what's gonna happen at the great white throne judgment. Everybody in hell is gonna be taken out of hell and stand before God. And here's what all the liars are gonna be saying. We're gonna get out. We're not gonna have to go back. We're gonna get another chance. Don't worry, everything's fine. Until they're judged by God and cast back into the lake of fire forever. It's too late. 
when your heart stops beating. Your hope is on this side of the graveyard, not the other. There's gonna be a rejection of sinners. Let me give you this last point and we'll be through. There's gonna be a revenging of the Savior. The revenging hand of the Savior is gonna move upon everybody who rejected him. It's a great white throne because his robe is white because he's pure. The throne is white. All the saints around the altar will be standing there. So we're all gonna be witnesses at the great white throne judgment. We're not gonna be on that side of the banister being judged. We're gonna be on this side of the banister watching the judgment, I believe, as witnesses. There's no fault in him. He's white because he's pure. Now get this, and I, I, I'm almost done. I was watching court TV, and I love to watch not all the preliminary stuff, but I like to come down to the closing arguments and the sentencing. And I'll be honest, I like to watch that because I like to see the attorneys giving their, I mean, their best to try to either prosecute the defendant or defend the defendant, and they're giving their very best. They're throwing everything they've got. And then I like to see the verdict, whether the judge gives it or whether the jury gives it. I like to see the verdict and see why it's taking place and what's going to happen. Several years ago, my wife and I were watching Court TV, and it was on cable when cable was fairly new. It's been a long time ago almost 20 years ago. We'd just gotten married. and So we're watching this court case and there was this man who committed murder while he was high. He killed somebody with an automobile. And the, this was several times that he had drove high and he didn't have a driver's license. And, and so they had stopped him and arrested him and put him in jail. And, and so they were actually, Brother Kelly, they were trying to get the death penalty for him. The judge did not give him the death penalty, but the judge gave him life in prison without any chance of parole. And I'll never forget, he had a six-year-old, a nine-year-old, and an 11-year-old boy. And they're sitting there, one row behind the defendant. The defendant's sitting there, and the wife is sitting beside him, the mother of the three children. And all of a sudden, the verdict came from the jury. It was handed to the judge. He had him stand up and he thanked the jury and he read the statement that you will be sentenced to life in prison without any chance of parole. And those little boys started crying. Man, they started just squealing and crying and screaming. When they realized, they looked over at mom and mama's head is down and she's shaking and tears are running down her eyes. And all of a sudden, those two boys jumped over the banister, the two oldest, and they ran to their daddy and the judge is smacking the gavel and, and, and the, 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 the security in the, in the courtroom has to come up and literally pry those boys off of their dad as they're screaming, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, daddy, please don't go, daddy, no, don't do it. Man, I'm talking about sitting in that motel room. Man, tears were running. Maybe... Maybe God will let, when you're sentenced to the lake of fire, maybe God will let you say something. Maybe, maybe God would grant you the chance, because we got eternity. There's no hurry. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So maybe if you choose not to accept Christ today, maybe when you're condemned to hell, you could say, Can I hug my family one more time? And maybe your saved family will be able to come out around the banister and hug you one more time before the demons of hell drag you away and cast, throw you into the lake of fire. Maybe you could say, well, Lord, I'd like to say something. I, Pastor Mark, I heard you preach. I'm sorry. Thanks for warning me. I should have I should have responded that day. I wish I, wish I would have listened. I, I just was so busy and I just, I just thought that it just seemed too simple and I just thought the Lord would never want me and I, I, just, I just thought. All excuses will be flimsy on that day. Miss Brittany, if you come. And then it brings me to the point that 
God shall wipe away all tears. Now, why would that be? Why does God have to do it after that? I'll tell you why. My grandpa Bishop on my daddy's side, unless he called out to God, unless he got saved when he had a stroke, unless he got saved that night in his camper beside our house, my daddy witnessed to him, prayed to him. I'm talking about, I've seen him. My dad and my grandpa, they played checkers every Monday night. And they played chess. And I've watched my dad sob. 30-year-old man, his shoulders shaking, bawling, begging my grandpa to come to Christ. And my grandpa wouldn't do it. Unless my grandpa called on the Lord in his camper right before he died, and I don't know, my grandpa's in hell. And I'm going to be honest, there's no way that Brother Gary, I can watch my grandpa cast into a lake of fire and there not be tears. There's going to be some crying in heaven. And for some of you, it's not too late for you to reach your grandpa, for you to reach your grandkids, for you to reach your loved ones, for you to reach your co-workers, for you to reach your neighbors. It's not too late. But one of these days it will be. But we, we could never enjoy heaven we can never enjoy heaven knowing our loved ones are burning in hell. We can never enjoy it. So God has to wipe away all tears, all memories, and allow us to enjoy heaven. There'll be a new heaven. There'll be a new earth. There'll be a new start. But before we ever get there, after this, is the judgment. Are you ready to stand before the Lord? Or will you stand in ashes? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm gonna ask two questions, we'll be done. How many of you would say, Pastor Mark, I know that I'm saved. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die today, I mean, there is not a question in my mind I would go to heaven. I'm not almost sure, I'm all the way sure. I know if I died today that I would go to heaven. If that's you, would you slip your hand up all over the building? Slip them up nice and high. Thank you. You can put them down. Heads are about eyes are closed. No one looking around. How many of you would say, Pastor Mark, I couldn't raise my hand right there. I'm just not sure where I'm going to spend eternity. I, I've got a lot of doubts. I've got a lot of fear. And, and when I think about it, I'm just not sure. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. If that's you this morning, would you slip your hand up? Thank you. I see that hand. Is there someone else? I see that hand. Thank you. Is there someone else? there's someone else, let me pray for you. Thank you, I see that hand. You can put it back down. Is there someone else? Is there someone else? Thank you, I see that hand in the back. You can put it down. Is there someone else? Is there anyone else? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one looking. Anyone else? We've got time. Let me pray for you this morning. Thank you, son. I see that hand. You can put it back down. Is there anyone else? There's been six or seven hands that are raised. In just a moment, in just a moment, you can know that you know that you're saved. If you'll just step out when we give this invitation and you'll make your way down to this old-fashioned altar and come take this preacher by the hand, we'll have somebody take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. Here's the second question, and I'm done. This is it. Pastor Mark, I know I'm saved, but I know I haven't been as surrendered as I should be to the Lord. There's some areas of my life that I know I've disappointed him, and I just don't want to disappoint the Lord anymore. I just don't want to disappoint him anymore. Pastor Mark, pray for me that I, I won't disappoint my daddy. I won't disappoint the God of this universe, my, my, my heavenly father. I won't disappoint him. Preacher, pray for me. If that's you, would you slip your hand up around the room? There's hands from the front all the way to the back. Thank you. You can put them down. In just a moment, we're going to stand our feet, and I want you to come and get on this altar and say, God, help me to never disappoint you again. Stand to your feet if you would. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father in heaven, I pray that you would draw the lost Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, convict the saved. And Lord, I pray that they would come and do business with you. And God, I pray that today we would see people, Lord, that have never, ever accepted you as their personal Savior or are living in doubts, that they would get those doubts settled today. And Lord, I pray that we would be more surrendered when we leave here than ever before. All this we ask in Jesus' name.